What we are going to be discussing this evening is the subject of UFOs, friend, foe, or fantasy. And it is a vast topic. I first became interested in unidentified flying objects back in the 1940s when there were reports of strange things occurring in the atmosphere immediately following World War II and started to keep my own file, newspaper clippings and so forth, on the things that were happening. Being born to research, so to speak, and being nosy by nature, I decided to follow up these various uh, occurrences or phenomena to try and get some pattern out of them. And I began to notice some amazing things. In 1947, Kenneth Arnold reported seeing some very large objects when he was flying uh, near Yakima, Washington, uh, over Mount Rainier. Then there were others who began to report uh, a multiplicity of sightings of objects in the air. All that we could get from the United States government officially was that they were unidentified flying objects. However, the popular name at the time was flying saucers. And sometimes they referred to as flying cigars because the larger ships, some of them as long as football fields by description, were like enormous zeppelins. Yet they moved with such rapidity and defied all the laws of gravity and aerodynamics that we know here on Earth that they were described as flying cylinders and laughingly by some as cigars. Now, UFOs, according to the acceleration of interest in them, are now being sighted, and I quote, at the rate of six per hour, according to known reports, that is, throughout the entire world. We're not talking anymore just about the United States, but the reports of many sightings simply are not reported in the papers or in the press. There has been a consistent effort not to panic the public on the part of government. And I can understand why they would take this attitude. We at Christian Research Institute, when our headquarters was located in New Jersey, began a research project on UFOs since I was a member of NICAP, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, to try and determine if all the material I had collected and others were collecting had any real semblance of congruity. And by the time NICAP had compiled its material, they had literally thousands of cases of sightings from all over the world. The Soviet Union vigorously denied the existence of unidentified flying objects. However, there was a slip in Pravda which stated that anybody who saw unidentified flying objects was drunk. Which meant that they didn't exist, but if you saw one, you were drunk which meant that no one was going to pay any attention to what you were saying. I recall when I first began to ask questions about this from the standpoint of the theological implications of unidentified flying objects, some of my colleagues said to me, you have done a marvelous job in research on the cult, the occult, comparative religion, and apologetics, and your other fields of expertise leave UFOs alone because everybody's going to think by the time you get finished that you stepped out of a flying saucer and no one's going to believe you. I ignored them with characteristic humility and proceeded to study even more on the subject, convinced that truth inevitably must come to the surface. I'm happy to say that after a rash of pulp publications, which are largely worthless, and scare tactics by people who have attached all kinds of things to them which have no real significance, there have been serious studies made of so-called unidentified flying objects. I possess, and it has been printed, the only color picture of a UFO taken at an altitude of 800 feet on a clear day in New Jersey, hovering near a seminary that exists. And this particular one, which generally I blow up on a wall about 10 by 15 feet so people can see it, and we have blown up large pictures of it, is of a circular ship with opaque windows circling it. Its dimensions, as far as we're able to determine, fixes about 50 to 75 feet across 
and at least 60 feet thick. It made no noise whatsoever. It was bluish gray in color, hovered, and then lazily took off straight up over the mountains. My assistant took the picture with a 35 millimeter camera on a clear day. And that picture was used on the front cover of a national publication as the first bona fide UFO sighting verified by unimpeachable sources. After all, seminary professors would hardly be lying about unidentified flying objects, particularly since my assistant who took the picture didn't believe they existed until he took the picture. Now he is a firm believer in the existence of unidentified flying objects. The case histories of UFO appearances and the sightings run all the way from Russia, Brazil, France, Africa to Yugoslavia, where people were panicked, according to reports there, and were, quote, running in shock, close quote, to escape what they thought was a UFO invasion. Anyone who remembers Orson Welles' broadcast in 1938 on the subject of the Martian invasion of the world can well understand why the government doesn't comment too much on unidentified flying objects. Wells did such a good job of convincing people that we really were being invaded from outer space, that people were out in their fields shooting at aircraft, and that cars and state policemen, it's a wonder people weren't killed as a result of this very dramatic presentation. So there is a reason why many of these things are not discussed. I'm indebted for a great deal of the research to the Christian Research Institute staff that spent quite a bit of time collating some 6,000 cases of sightings from bona fide sources, and then culling all of the sources until we arrived at airline pilots, Air Force and Navy pilots, and individual observers who could not possibly have any ulterior motive for testifying to what they had seen. And so, I owe a great debt to those who went through a vast amount of material. John Weldon, a close friend and associate in research, did a tremendous job of collating a great deal of this material. In fact, I've encouraged him to publish it, and it is being published in a nice paperback book by Harvest House, A Christian Analysis of Unidentified Flying Objects. Now, you may not agree with Mr. Weldon's conclusions, but you will certainly have to pay attention to Mr. Weldon's research, because he has done his homework, and the sources are unimpeachably authentic. In 1965, 1967, there are large international incidents concerning UFO sightings, particularly the summer of 1972 and in October of 1973. NBC released a white paper on the subject of unidentified flying objects. The most startling report came, however, in the fall of 1973, when two shipyard workers in Pascagoula, Mississippi, were taken aboard a UFO for 20 minutes and given a complete physical examination. The government investigated the report in detail. The conclusion of the investigators, independent and government, is that there is, quote, no reason to suppose that these men were not recounting some type of experience or incident, close quote. That's a nice way of saying something happened to them, but without saying it was actually aboard an unidentified flying object. Mr. Weldon points out that UFOs have seemed to lose their shyness in recent years. Sightings were rare in the 40s, speeded up in the 50s, died off in the 60s and have accelerated in the 1970s. Strangely enough, the first major sightings of UFOs followed within three years of the major explosion of an atomic weapon on Earth, which lends credence to some of the contactees, some of the people who claim they have talked to the inhabitants of flying objects. 
that they became interested in Earth when they noted accelerated radiation coming from our planet and had arrived at the conclusion that we had begun to experiment with atomic weapons. I suppose having observed Earth for a long period of time, they concluded that perhaps they had better look in on us rapidly. Our long record of destroying each other might extend with rocket power to other parts of the solar system. And therefore, investigation obviously began. One of the leading Soviet scientists, Dr. Felix Weigel, has stated that in the USSR there has been an acceleration, a constant stream of reported sightings. He says they are well documented, quote, from every corner of the USSR, close quote. So the Soviet has moved from the 1950s when they said you were drunk if you saw it, to the 1970s where there's an awful lot of drunk Russians because people are seeing it from every corner of the Soviet Union. Now, there's been a tremendous fascination, of course, with UFOs, particularly in the light of von Daniken's books, Eric von Daniken's books, The Chariot of the Gods, The Gold of the Gods, other books with God and astronauts, things of this nature. We're going to be lecturing on that subject tomorrow evening. Chariot of the Who will be our subject tomorrow night, where we'll be discussing all of these supposed ideas about God being an astronaut. But this has focused a tremendous amount of attention on the subject of unidentified flying objects. But the interest in UFOs stems not just from occultic sources and from people like Van Daniken, but this is quite significant. A Gallup poll released November 29, 1973, indicated that some 15 million adult Americans have personally seen unidentified flying objects. In 1966, a similar survey by Gallup indicated that 5.5% of the adult population had seen UFOs. So, the sightings are now double what they were seven years ago. The 1973 poll, incidentally, showed that 51% of those interviewed believe that unidentified flying objects are real. Far from just being science fiction buffs and people who are interested in them being kooky, and there are kooks and oddballs that have been interested in them, there is now a respectable inquiry being directed by scientists, reputable physicists, and astronomers into the subject of unidentified flying objects. And the basic thesis which I enunciated in the 1950s and again in the 1960s through Christian Research Institute, I enunciate again today. These findings must have theological implications for the Church of Jesus Christ. We simply cannot ignore the possibility that we are dealing with something either extraterrestrial or ultra-dimensional. And the church has to begin to analyze what the world has come to recognize as objective reality. Now, part of the great picture and development of UFOlogy, as it is called, points to the fact that organizations such as the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, with representatives in 50 countries, 38 consulting PhDs in various sciences, have now begun serious in-depth studies of UFOs. Senator Barry Goldwater just recently joined the prestigious National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomena. He himself is a Brigadier General in the Air Force Reserve. He joined the Board of Governors. The President of the United States, when he was a senator, directed inquiries to the Pentagon concerning UFO sightings which his constituency was concerned about. He was told then as a senator it was classified information and Senator Goldwater was told, quote, it was none of his blank business, close quote. Therefore, since these two sources in their investigation have had difficulty obtaining confirmation, 
there is no reason to suppose that the average American is going to have any success whatsoever getting official confirmation from governmental sources. On Dick Cavett's show, an interview took place between astronaut James McDevitt, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who is chairman of the Department of Astronomy at Northwestern University, and Charles Hickson, one of the men who reportedly boarded the UFO at Pascagoula. This took place November 2nd, 1973. Dr. Hynek is a convert who before poo-pooed unidentified flying objects and explained them away on various scientific grounds. He now heads an organization seriously investigating with hundreds of scholars all over the world the implications scientifically of unidentified flying objects and the implications that they have for those of us who are living on this earth. In the course of my investigation of these things, I've been struck by the fact that people seem to bend over backwards to explain away unidentified flying objects. Here are some of the explanations which have been given at various times by the Air Force and by official sources. Artificial satellites, temperature inversions or changes, light refraction, high altitude weather balloons, mirages, shooting stars, marsh gas, ball lightning, and of course, the old familiar hallucination. All used as a means of discouraging inquiry into unidentified flying objects. Now, I'm sure that you're sitting there saying, has Martin ever been on a flying saucer? No. Doesn't want to go, either. <laughs> has Martin ever seen flying saucers? Yes. Certainly. And they are of different sizes and shapes. The question in my mind is not what, but who. I know what they are. Heineck knows what they are. The United States government knows what they are. The Soviet government knows what they are. Everybody who's done any investigation in depth knows what they are. They are some form of of extremely sophisticated aircraft not made by any government occupying territory on our earth that we know of. Their capacities are utterly astounding. They have been clocked at speeds in excess of 25,000 miles per hour in our atmosphere. At speeds that rapid, you would burn up normally. Yet, they make right angle turns at speeds of 5,000 miles per hour in our atmosphere. You couldn't make a right angle turn at that speed without disintegrating in our atmosphere. They go straight up or straight down, left or right, and accelerate from a few hundred miles per hour to thousands of miles per hour in seconds. They appear to defy all the known laws of gravity. And scientists have suggested that this is perhaps because they generate their own gravitational field based upon our poles and some form of magnetic induction. We do not know the explanation, but we know that the aircraft exist. UFOs are inevitably characterized as a secret weapon of the enemy. The Russians tell their people that they're theirs, and our people are told that they belong to us. Everybody is scared to death to talk about whose they really are, because nobody truly knows. The only thing that is known is that we are definitely trying to explain naturally, and with all forms of evasion, what quite obviously disturbs the heads of the military and of our governments. There's an interesting book called UFOs, Past, Present, and Future, which deals with cases of UFO sightings from 1947 through 1973 with consistent verification. I myself have verification of more than 600 cases which defy any of the explanations given 
by the federal government or any investigating commission. You just simply cannot explain them away. I have seen films taken in Utah of three UFOs in living color traveling for a period of about 45 seconds. And they are moving similar to floating ping pong balls. And you can't get these films anymore. I've tried to get them back again, but I've seen them. And against the blue sky, these three objects move clearly in front of you, photographed with a 16 millimeter camera, and then just as rapidly take off into the clouds. They are solid objects, and their dimension is approximately what I cited before concerning the ones which I have seen, at least the one which we were able to photograph. There's a good deal of verification from very interesting and, I believe, definitely sincere sources that point out that UFOs cannot be ignored. Now, the Condon report was issued. Physicist Edward Condon headed it up as a result of the Air Force trying to whitewash the subject of UFOs. They studied from 1966 to 1968 to undertake a depth study of UFOs. The report came out negative. But the Condon report was rejected in 1970 by no less a body of the, than the American Association for the Advancement of Science, who declared, quote, the Condon conclusions are scientifically unacceptable, close quote. So we are now right back where we started, only with one more leg up. We are aware of the fact that there is good scientific background behind studied investigation of UFO phenomena. J. Allen Hynek, who had served as a learned skeptic on Project Grudge. I hope you noticed the name of these projects. First there was Project Blue Book. That was closed down after 20 years. Then there was Project Grudge. And after Project Grudge, they moved to Project Cyclops. They might just as well have classified all of them Project Blanknet because no one really wanted to see what was going on. And if they did, they were constantly telling the public that these things could be easily explained as natural phenomena. We see now that these things simply are not dismissed so lightly. The North American Defense Command has posted for all its pilots a directive which says that they are to, and I quote, report immediately all other aircraft and uh, unidentified flying objects, close quote. So the Air Force apparently takes very seriously what they tell the public doesn't exist. Report it immediately. Report what? What isn't there? Because they must know something is there and something that has tremendous implications. Now, there have been UFO sightings all through history. And if you go back and study it, you'll find since 1897, there have been more than 2,500 contacts with unidentified flying objects. That is with individuals, ships, all different types of stories connected with UFOs. The number of recorded observations for all time up to 1954 was approximately 10,000. Since then, it has risen in sightings to the millions. Mr. Weldon says, and I quote him, We can only offer the evidence and sources for consideration. We can only say that men noted strange objects in the skies and left their evidences of their observations as far back as 45,000 B.C. So there are people who through the ages have been noticing phenomena. What struck me is that when I started to study it, I began to notice so many people were describing the same thing only in the language of their time or their culture. And I'd like to just look at a couple of these because I think they're fascinating. The early Hindu literature, which predates the Christian era by thousands of years, contains references to, quote, celestial and aerial cars, 
close quote. Now, you wouldn't expect an Indian guru to be talking about a rocket ship. But if he talked about some kind of a celestial car, not as we think of an automobile, but some type of a box or some kind of a device which floated in the sky, that made sense to him. And there are records taken from the Indian civilization which describe aerial cars and bright clouds in the sky. There are many references in the ancient Tibetan books, excuse me, Tibetan books, which talk about these very things. The writings of certain Roman historians, well corroborated in other areas. Records, there are records of incidents of unidentified flying objects in the skies over Rome in the fourth and the third, in the third centuries. One particular scholar, Dr. Wilkins, specifies that Roman historians and scholars, among them Pliny, Seneca, Tacitus, Lycosthenes, several other chroniclers of the time, all make mention of this phenomenon. Titus Livius, Julius Obsquians, list eight specific locations of sightings extending from one at the Gulf of Venice in 213 B.C. to Umbria in 16 B.C. Pliny spoke of a fiery shield, that's a direct quote, that swept across the sky, and the historian Livy wrote of phantom ships for celestial craft which were sighted in his time, 60 to 17 B.C. The Egyptians, who were no fools as scientists, in their times, noted the phenomena of UFOs. A papyrus record at the annals of Pharaoh Thutmose III, 1600 B.C., mentions circles of fire in the sky. The circles were as bright as the sun, according to the record, very numerous, and they dominated the sky. A terrible stench, a factor common to many modern reports, was associated with the appearance of these circles of fire. One of the things that we've noticed about some UFO sightings in our own day is that when a UFO lands, often the earth is scorched in a circle or in the shape of that ship. There is either radiation at that point detected or a terrible odor. And this particular reference to a bad odor goes all the way back to the Egyptians, 1600 B.C., who noted that this particular type of celestial craft generated a most disagreeable odor. We still don't know what the odor is, but we know this much. It certainly influenced the Egyptians enough to write down the things that they saw. Now, I could go on citing instance after instance. August 12, 1883, the first known photograph of a UFO was taken by Jose Bonilla, a Mexican astronomer associated with the Zatacas Observatory. He'd been observing the sun. He suddenly saw an army of objects crossing its front. He counted nearly 150 of them, cigar and spindle shaped, which show in the photo. This was the first photograph of these particular objects. I'm impressed, however, not with the great history of the description of phenomena, but with something that happened in our own country because it was a great embarrassment to those who are trying to say UFOs don't exist. In 1952, the Air Force was scrambled in Washington, D.C. because UFOs were buzzing the White House. They showed clearly, I'm reading the report, on the radar screen, a tracking of five in a fleet. One of them achieved Mach plus speed at 93,000 feet. Project Blue Book to collect data again was undertaken. This particular buzzing of the White House in 1952 was an occasion that the newspapers could not ignore. The restricted air zone around the White House is one of the best defended areas in the world. The best jet pilots are assigned to protect the capital of the United States. The UFOs appeared in force. The jets were scrambled immediately. A true UFO chase was underway. The jets didn't have a chance. 
When the jets came screaming into the White House airspace, the UFOs left the scene at 7,000 miles per hour on the radar screen. Now, you have to stop for just a second and think about that figure of speed. We are talking about a transcontinental plane, the Concorda, which flies from Paris to New York in two hours and 25 minutes and travels at 1,500 plus miles per hour. You, this is in 1975. We are talking about 1972. Excuse me, 952. And we are talking about UFOs on a radar screen with jets on the same radar screen tracking them. The speeds can be calibrated. Any radar expert will tell you that. The UFOs accelerated away from the jets in 1952 at a speed in excess of 7,000 miles per hour which is roughly four and a quarter times the speed of the Concordia more than 20 years ago. Which indicates that either the radar technicians didn't see anything on the screen or the jet pilots didn't see anything when they were tracking them and they said they did. Luminous objects that disappeared straight up with extreme rapidity the report. Or we are faced with UFOs who apparently can come and go as they please in any part of the world and are impervious to attack by any form of aircraft that any nation can mount against them. The jets were called back and the pilots were all shaken up. No sooner had the pilots returned to base Then the alert sounded again, and they were scrambled. The UFOs were back. This game of hide-and-seek went on for six hours, recorded on the radar screens by the Navy and the Air Force, until they decided that they had played enough, and then took off at a very great speed, leaving... Very red-faced F-94 pilots and individuals who kept saying there wasn't anything trying to explain what they were chasing. The greatest landmark in UFO history took place, however, in December 15, 1974. On that day, the United States government started to bring the UFOs out of the closet. I don't know whether you saw the NBC TV special, UFOs. Do you believe? If you did, there was a very conservative estimate given by intelligent, rational scholars about what the meaning of UFOs was all about. No longer was there the curt dismissal as insane or hallucinatory or just some kind of natural phenomena to do away with it. There was now a studied attempt to say, something is going on, and we'd like to know what it's all about. Would you? It is anticipated that more of these programs will emerge as more information begins to filter to the public about UFOs. Now, why take the time and the effort to give a recap of thousands of years of the history of the development of UFOlogy? Why, says the Christian, should we pay any attention to this at all? After all, what's buzzing around in the atmosphere is the concern of the scientists, not us. There is a very real reason, and this is the reason. The Bible says nothing whatsoever about the subject of unidentified flying objects. Despite Mr. Van Daniken, God was an astronaut, and all of the multiple packages of pulp garbage which are being distributed all over the world in multiple languages. The evidence for the existence of God as an astronaut isn't. 
but the reality of the phenomena is. And the Christian church simply cannot ignore it any longer. I said it in 1956, 1962, 1968, and now 1975. And responsible Christian theologians, including the late C.S. Lewis, called attention to the fact that it had tremendous implications for the Christian church. Because if there are other civilizations, if there is life in other worlds, then we have to take a good long look at the theology of the New Testament, the concept of salvation, and what are these beings doing down here? Why are they here? Surely something as important as this would not have been neglected by God. And yet, there is no evidence in the scripture to back it up. Now, attempts have been made, the spaceships of Ezekiel, to make Ezekiel's wheel within the wheel, whirling dervish-type spaceships. Not a shred of evidence in Ezekiel, in the Hebrew or the English, to back this up. You can read Ezekiel 1 and 3, from now the purgatory freezes over, and you will never ever get any information about flying saucers out of that. You can look at all of the references that are supposed to indicate unidentified flying objects in the atmosphere in the Bible, and you get nothing out of it at all except what you want to read into it. I am simply urging Christians to take a very serious look at the implications of it. What does it mean? What does it do to Christian theology? If anything, how does the Christian cope with it? And do we just sweep it under the rug and say it didn't happen? Or do we say, yes, it's real, and what does the whole thing mean in the context of biblical revelation? C.S. Lewis put it this way, in a little pamphlet entitled, Will We Find God in Outer Space? He said, God is the God of the cosmos, the creator of all things. Wherever we go any place in his creation, there we will find his identity, his power, and the knowledge of him as creator. We need not be afraid of outer space, because God is the God of time and space. And no one need fear anything concerning his power in the universe. He made the worlds. He created all things. Only, if in the words of J.B. Phillips, your God is too small, are you going to become confused or frightened by scientific evidence and empirical evidence of unidentified flying objects. Now, there are many descriptions of them. They have different shapes. Potatoes, crescents, arches, drums, discs, donuts. These are all descriptions given by people who have seen them. Size, anywhere from one 19-foot tail to the length of a football field. The body shapes are glowing and those which have absolutely no reflective capacity at all. People that are inside them allegedly have everything from glowing torsos, fish scale skins, no fingers, one eye, giant ears, humanoid monsters, 13 feet tall, four-legged creatures, or asparagus-like beings. <laughs> People do manage to give some fascinating descriptions of what they see. But you know, one thing emerges from all of these sightings which just simply cannot be denied. All of these people everywhere saw something. Either in something, coming out of something, or in connection with something. And you know, you simply cannot dismiss all of it as conjecture, hallucination, or the result of natural phenomena. Their size of the UFO characteristic, three foot, three to four feet to 500 yards. Their colors, orange, blue, red, green, black, purple, yellow. And then they change color in flight. 
I don't know how many of you read the book, Incident at Exeter, in which a young man in Exeter, New Hampshire, in the armed forces, I believe the Navy, was walking back to his base one night on a clear night with the moon out and the stars looking down. And as he approached a farmhouse, the horses in the farmyard began to kick in their stalls and there was a tremendous amount of uh, activity generated. The dogs began to bark that were around the farm. He didn't know what was going on. He was just walking by on the road. And suddenly, over a clump of trees, an enormous circular object lazily floated with orange and red and yellow blinking lights. It was iridescent in color and just hung there looking at him. He was cold sober and utterly terrified. He started to run and it sort of lazily floated around the farmyard, the animals and everything going on and their usual barking and the horses kicking and all kinds of noise being generated. And a car came down the road and he flagged it and managed to be taken to a local police station. When he arrived at the police station, almost out of his mind in shock, he tried to describe to the policeman what had happened. The policeman smelled his breath and ascertained that he was not drinking. And then thought perhaps that he was suffering from a hallucination on drugs. He was examined. Nothing wrong with him. One of the policemen said, look, where did you see it? And he described it. Let's go back and you'll see for yourself it's not there. He said, I don't want to go back. The policeman said, don't be afraid, I'll go with you. <laughs> so the policeman went and got in the squad car and so did the young sailor. And they drove back to the farm and there was nothing there. And there was no noise and the moon was out and the stars, everything was perfectly normal. The policeman got out of the car and took him and said, now look, you see there's nothing here. There's no shift, there's no blinking light, there's no problems whatsoever. And all of a sudden, over the house and trees, floated what wasn't there into full vision. The policeman said he reached for his gun and then thought better about it because it was an enormous ship. He just stood there and then bolted back to the squad car, grabbed the two-way radio, called the station and said, I'm out here at the farm. And the guy on the other end said, so you're out at the farm. He said, I see it. I see it. He said, what do you see? He says, what we said wasn't there. I see it. It's there. I'm looking at it. He said, what is it? He said, I don't know what it is. All I know is it's big, it's silver, it's got blinking lights. And, oh, God, am I scared. <laughs> and the both of them jumped into the car and split, as the saying goes. Well, that was the basis of a book entitled Incident at Exeter. And just how hard everybody worked in the government to suppress what the sailors saw. There was a, a night flight of Air Force planes that night that went over. Exercise training drills. All kinds of explanations were given. But the affidavit of the officer and the young sailor told the story. Both described the same phenomena and there was no mistake. In the book Interrupted Journey, we had the story of Betty and Barney Hill, whose car was stopped by a UFO parked across the road, which took them out of the car into the UFO and gave them a complete physical examination. The occupants were very amused by the fact that Barney had false teeth. Because apparently from where, the, from where they came, or apparently from that part of the galaxy inhabited by them, people didn't have false teeth. And so they were amazed by the constant fact that uh, inhabitants of this planet had false teeth. 
They gave him a complete physical at her. They didn't talk. The occupants looked very much like us, except a little shorter. Their eyes, instead of being slanted the way oriental eyes are, upwards, were slanted the opposite way. Their skin looked pretty much like ours. Their noses were smaller. Their fingers and hands were small, and they were in what appeared to be spacesuits. Barney was so terrified that he passed out in the semi-consciousness, and two of them came around to the car and lifted him out. Since he couldn't walk, they had to carry him, one under one arm, one under the other, and he remembers being dragged across the road and across the field, and the tops of his shoes banging against the rocks on the way to the spaceship, which was parked a little ways away. He had a complete physical. They asked him a number of questions, but never speaking. They seemed to be communicating by some type of telepathy so that he understood what they were saying, but they never spoke. The same was true of his wife. She, too, had a complete physical. Afterwards, the doctor who did the examining said, we will give you something and you will not remember anything. And we mean you no harm. Uh, when they woke up, they were back in the car. They couldn't remember anything at all and returned home. But they had recurrent dreams, he did, of this some type of light and people and some type of examination. He didn't know what it was, but it terrified him. He went to a psychiatrist. Also, his groin broke out in a circular rash. And when they had a complete physical, different types of objects were fitted over the body, including the reproductive organs. And in this particular instance, when he described to the psychiatrist what had happened to him, he described under hypnosis, or sodium pentothal, what took place in the spaceship and an examination of his reproductive organs, organs indicated this is exactly what had happened. He had the marks on his body. Also, the tops of his shoes were all scuffed and torn. The bottoms of his shoes were perfectly normal. Just as he said, he had been lifted across the road and dragged. She began to remember things also. The book interrupted journey. Fantastic story of people who, normal people, I might add, who had an encounter of extraterrestrial proportions. Now, these are not irresponsible people. These are not fringe occultists. These are not people looking for publicity. These are normal human beings encountering a phenomena they had no explanation for and rightly terrified of. Now, for us, we have to have explanations. So, as Christians and as thinking people, let's examine the explanations and then the scriptures. First of all, there are only seven possible explanations for the entire phenomena. And anybody who tries to go beyond that is merely fishing. The whole thing is a hoax. Nobody ever really encountered anything and all the reports which have been circulated never happened. Everybody in all the thousands of cases and all through the centuries had been misled by what they thought was something that wasn't there. Or it was deliberately contrived by some people to mislead. It's a hoax. This is ruled out immediately by the fact that reputable scientists, as well as average human beings all over the world, have experienced the same phenomena. And in any closed experiment, that is factual data. It cannot be denied. Not a hoax. Secondly, it's natural phenomena. Ball lightning, plasma, or perhaps balloons that floated up into the atmosphere, weather balloons, birds, temperature inversion. After we explain all of those things away, we cannot explain away more than 2,000 sightings by pilots and by people who know the skies and what flies through them, all of whom testify to the same thing. The phenomena is reality. So it is just not natural phenomena. It's beyond natural phenomena. There are other things. And then the third one. It's interplanetary. Somewhere within our solar system, we are being visited by people. Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, wherever they are. They are visiting our planet from our own solar system. 
Perhaps the moon, the dark side, is one of their bases. This is refuted by the fact that giant telescopes all over Earth on a 24-hour monitoring of the skies have failed to produce any evidence of spaceships or anything traveling interplanetary, and they could easily be spotted. Certainly something traveling as close as the moon, which is only 238,000 miles away. So it's not interplanetary in our solar system as we see it here with our planets. Five, we are dealing with what is, excuse me, four, we are dealing with what is intergalactic. That is from another solar system. We are dealing with people who are visiting us from another solar system just as we might visit another world if we had the capability to get there. We are now sending probes to different planets. They are talking about sending spaceships to planets to explore. We would follow the same process and methodology of taking soil samples, plant samples, even examining people if we got the chance. Just as the phenomena recorded on Earth indicates, somebody else was doing. Perhaps is still doing. So intergalactial from outer space to here must remain an open option. And then fifth, we simply have to face the fact that there might be a civilization on our own planet which we do not know anything about. Our own planet has not been totally explored. There are portions of it which we are not thoroughly acquainted with. There is a possibility that another civilization exists which has had the remarkable good sense not to make any contact with us. Therefore, may have remained totally free from war and many of the things which accompany it. This is a theory which has been advanced by some scientists, but I must say there exists no evidence for it. Some UFOs have been seen going into the water, particularly off the Bermuda Triangle, called the Devil's Triangle, but no evidence can be shown, and some off California too, I might add. No evidence has been shown of a civilization under our planetary crust or around our continents that we have any indication of. The best scientific evidence is this is not true. The sixth is that it's a secret weapon. Developed by the Soviet Union or by the United States, and everybody's keeping quiet about it. I really hope it's true that we've got it. Because if we have, back in 1952, we had something that would travel at a speed of an excess of 7,000 miles per hour. Think of all the money we could have saved in our space program. One of those things could have gone from Earth to Moon. And you can't calibrate the advances we would have been able to make. No. Russia would have been there first if it was theirs. And we would have been there a long time ago if it were ours. So it isn't a secret weapon anybody we know has. But I venture to say that the Pentagon and the Kremlin would like to have it as a secret weapon as soon as they could get hold of it. And seventh reason is Mr. Weldon's conclusion, and it merits honest consideration. Supposing we are dealing with ultra-dimensional beings. Supposing that what we are seeing is what the Bible talks about in Luke chapter 23. Men's hearts will fail them, Jesus said, for the things that are coming upon the earth. Supposing the symbolic language of the book of Revelation, which speaks of the bottomless pit being opened. Not talking about a pit which is down, but instead one that is up. Since in space there is neither up nor down. Supposing what comes upon earth comes from space, not from under the earth. Supposing that symbolic language is talking about the manifestation of the powers of darkness near the consummation of the age. We know that Antichrist will reveal himself with signs and lying wonders 
if it were possible, he would deceive even the elect. The world is not looking for a theological savior. The world is looking for a technological savior. The world is looking for someone to appear who will solve the problem of famine, solve the problem of multiplicity of births, solve the problems of war, solve the problems of disease. Someone who will appear and create what unregenerate men want, heaven on earth on their terms. What better way for the forces of darkness to reveal themselves on earth? than to appear to be the saviors of mankind. What interests me about Weldon's conjecture, and one which I had myself 20 years ago, is that the world of the occult has embraced ufology. The world of the occult and the people who are in it speak constantly of contact with people in UFOs. Uri Geller, the psychic from Stanford University, the amazing man who is able to bend keys and knives and forks by an act of will, and who can stop watches simply by commanding them, who can tell what is on the face of dice in closed containers, and who says that he is the product of forces from another world who placed him here to enable men to see that these forces are benevolent and that they want to lead us to a higher life. Way back in the 1950s, George Adamski, who first wrote on the subject of UFOs with great persuasion, stated that he had talked with people from UFOs, and that they had told him, man should not fear death, because reincarnation took place all over the cosmos, and that all over the universe, planets were populated by souls which had lived here and died and been reincarnated elsewhere. In fact, John Keel, who's written extensively on UFOs and the occult, points out that the people who are involved in contact with UFOs invariably say that the occupants of these ships talk to them about the truth of reincarnation and about universal salvation for all mankind. The theology of the people in the UFOs is to me most revealing. I cataloged what their theology is. This is gleaned from the people that claim to have talked with them. They do not believe that God is a personal being. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. They do not believe that the Bible alone is God's word to the world. They do not believe in punishment. They do not believe in resurrection. They believe instead in reincarnation. And that man himself can evolve from planet to planet to perfection. What you are dealing with is a theology opposed to Christianity. Now I would suggest a serious evaluation. Perhaps what we are dealing with are ultra-dimensional beings who have the capacity to manifest themselves in our atmosphere and to convince anybody with signs and lying wonders who may be able to demonstrate with motion pictures in three dimensions to the satisfaction of people on earth the history of our race and to be able to show us what took place in the past even to debunking our religions and showing that Moses really got the Ten Commandments from an astronaut who cut it out of rock for him with some kind of ray gun. Wouldn't it be amazing if an advanced technology, supposedly, purported to be the savior of mankind and the creator of Homo sapiens? And here, with all of the frills of scientific accomplishment. It demonstrates itself at the end of the ages, purporting to be our deliverer, instead, our deceiver. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we are told that when Satan appears in human form, 
he appears in Antichrist, who with all deceivableness of unrighteousness leads men to destruction. He is believed by those who refuse the knowledge of the truth. I cannot accept the idea that UFOs are a hoax. My own investigation and that of many others is far too conclusive. I cannot accept natural phenomena as the across-the-board, so to speak, explanation. And I certainly reject the idea of interplanetary, intergalactic, and civilizations on our planet. I know it's not a secret weapon. I don't buy it because the evidence isn't there. But what I am willing to seriously consider is that at the end of the ages, the God of the Bible, who warned us to beware of signs in the heavens, might indeed be telling us to be very careful of what we put our trust in, including people, allegedly, who come from other worlds with the intent of being our deliverers. It might just be that the UFO is very real, but it is real because its working is after the power of Satan, with all signs, power, and lying wonders. If Satan is the god of this age, there is no reason why, at the end of the age, he cannot appear to be its savior. He has always wanted to be the object of worship. I don't know if this is true. But one thing I do know, the UFO is real, and the evidence from occultic sources is that it is hostile to Christianity. I am led, therefore, to only one conclusion, that the Christian position must be that our hope is not based upon those who would deliver us from other worlds, but upon Jesus Christ who died once for all in this world to reconcile us to God. And that the message of the church must not alter in the light of all the phenomena that may be revealed around us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going to prepare a place for you. And since I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Church of Jesus Christ is looking for that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ who shall transform these bodies of our humiliation, that they shall become like unto his own glorious body, through that power whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. This is our hope. And we consider all phenomena to be weighed and wanting in its light. Shall we pray? Our Father, bless thy word, that it may touch each one of our hearts and that we may see that the most important thing for the church to remember is that nothing can affect the truthfulness of thy revelation. Sanctify us through thy truth, Father. Thy word is truth. Give us a clear vision of the days in which we live. Protect us from the wicked one. And teach us that regardless of what forces may be unleashed on earth, Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we ask with thanksgiving. Amen.